right? Poland matters because it's sandwiched in between Russia and Germany or the Soviet Union and Germany or way back when Austria, Hungary, Germany and Russia. Poland matters. Korea matters because Korea is sandwiched in between Japan, China and Russia. The three countries that have the worst geographical location in the world are Korea and Poland. And now I think you could probably throw in Ukraine, right? These are countries that really are in the wrong location, right? And they're minor powers, they matter. But by and large, by and large, realism is a theory that focuses on the great powers and it focuses on the balance of power. Right. The argument that realists make is that those great powers care greatly about how much power they have relative to the other great powers in the system. Um, realists, as you know, pay little attention to domestic politics. Realists basically treat states as black boxes. It doesn't matter to most realists whether a state is a uh, democracy or an authoritarian state. The structure of the international system in the realist story basically forces most states to behave in similar ways. Right? And you can see where Americans would hate a theory like that because Americans believe that the world is populated by good guys and bad guys and we're the good guys and other states that look like us are also good guys, but everybody else is a bad guy. And it's kind of consistent with liberal hegemony, right? And that's why we want to make all of the states in the world liberal democracies, because they then all look like us. And if we're the good guys and everybody looks like us, that means you have a planet that's populated by good guys. And in a planet that's populated by good guys, you can't have anything but happy outcomes, right? That's the liberal story. The realist story is it just doesn't matter. Right. And the real story is that the big enchiladas in the system are going to compete with each other and this occasionally going to fight wars with each other. Now, very important to understand that there's a distinction between defensive realists and offensive realists. And I want to talk about the defensive realists. The defensive realists are a very interesting lot. Their basic message is that the structure of the international system encourages states not to go to war with each other. States, they say, should concentrate on defending the balance of power, not trying to change the balance of power. It's a really quite interesting argument. And the key reason for this is balancing behavior. If the three of us are great powers, and I start to accumulate more power, these two other states are going to get very nervous. They're going to form a military alliance and they're going to try and contain us. The defensive realists would say, look at what happened to Napoleonic France. They got greedy and they got crushed by a balancing coalition of five European states. Look at what happened to Imperial Germany. Look at what happened to Nazi Germany. Look at what happened to Imperial Japan. They got aggressive, balancing coalitions formed, and they were crushed. The Germans should have just sat still. The Japanese should have just sat still. They were in the catbird seat. No need, no need to be aggressive. And when you are aggressive, you get crushed. So you have defensive realists like my good friend Charlie Glazer, who wrote a famous article called realists as optimists, right? So you can see why these guys like restraint, right? Because realism leads to no war. Here's Mark Trachtenberg, another good friend of mine, historian, first class historian. These are some quotes from an article that he wrote. Realism is at heart a theory of peace, right? Power is not unstable. It's impractical idealism, that's liberal hegemony, that leads to endless conflict. Serious trouble developed only when states failed to act in a way that made sense in power political terms. Right. 
So the case from restraint from a defensive realist point of view, right, uh, really leads to a remarkably peaceful world. Now, as many of you know, there are offensive realists out there in the world, like me, who think the defensive realists are wrong. I believe that the structure of the system is not benign. It encourages states to compete with each other for power, right? States constantly want to improve their position in the balance of power. And for me, the ultimate goal is to be the hegemon in the system. And sometimes states will go to war to achieve that end. I do not believe like Mark Trachtenberg or Charlie Glazer or Ken Waltz or Steve Van Ever or Jack Snyder, all these defensive realists, that structure is benign. I have a much more Hobbesian view of the world. Uh, still, even offensive realists like me, right, would argue that if you follow the precepts, my theory, you'll have a less warlike world than you will following the precepts of liberal hegemony. And why is that the case? Three reasons. Here's the first. First, realists are only willing to fight in limited areas of the world. Liberal hegemonists want to fight everywhere because they're interested in spreading liberal democracy all over the planet. There is no area of the world that is unimportant from a strategic point of view for a liberal hegemonist. They don't prioritize. There are no priorities. For a realist, that's not true at all. During the Cold War, the United States was interested in competing with the Soviets all over the planet. Realists said this is ridiculous. There are only three areas of the world that matter for the United States. Europe, in those days we used to say Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Those are the three areas you fight and die. The rest of the Middle East, no. Africa, no. Central Asia, no. Southeast Asia, no. It's no accident that every realist except Henry Kissinger was opposed to the Vietnam War. It's a strategically unimportant area. You only fight in areas where there are great powers, or in the case of the Gulf, a critical resource, oil. But again, for liberals, a very different story. Reason number two, realists understand, even offensive realists like me, understand that balancing behavior takes place. I believe that if China continues to grow in terms of economic and military power, and it begins to assert its influence in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, over Taiwan, and in other places on its periphery, there'll be a very powerful balancing coalition that forms against it. And there'll be limits to what the Chinese can do. This is the defensive realist argument. I think they take it too far. They don't understand that sometimes states don't balance effectively and there's opportunities to acquire power on a part of the aspiring hegemon. But the point here is all realists understand basic balancing logic. Liberals don't. Because liberals believe that realists like me and even realists like Mark Trachtenberg are products of the 17th century. We're old think. We're dinosaurs. So they just think you can, this gets back to my discussion of NATO yesterday, they think that you can march NATO right up to Russia's borders and it's not going to matter to the Russians. Realists say this is crazy. You march NATO up to Russia's borders, you're going to have big trouble. No surprise that you had a war over Georgia in August 2008 and that you have a war in Ukraine starting in February 2014. Basic balance of power logic. But liberals don't believe in balance of power logic. And what I'm saying to you here is that if you understand realist logic, it makes you much more cautious. And that gets to my third point. It's not something that's peculiar to realism, but it does tend to be peculiar to realists. Realists are basically Clausewitzians, 
Realists, for the most part, pay a lot of attention to military affairs. They read Clausewitz. They take him very seriously. They study military history. Uh, liberals don't. And when you read Clausewitz and you study military history, you understand you're in the realm of unintended consequences. Anybody who goes to war thinking this is going to be easy, the way all these boys and girls in the Bush administration, and even outside the Bush administration, thought when we went into Iraq in 2003, these people are living in a dream world. It's just not the way international politics works. You go to war, it's basically a crapshoot. This is the realm of unintended consequences. Incredibly complicated enterprise war. How it all turns out, hard to predict. Of course, sometimes you go because the potential benefits far outweigh the costs, and you think the likelihood of success is quite high. But, uh, but realists tend to be very cautious. So the point I'm making to you here is you have this group of defensive realists who believe that the structure is remarkably benign. So if you adopt a realist foreign policy, you get no war. Then you have realists like me who don't accept that view, who think that realism does lead to a rather Hobbesian world. But nevertheless, even for realists of my stripe, you'll get a less aggressive foreign policy than you get with liberal hegemony. Because again, with realists, you get priorities, respect for balancing behavior, and respect for the fact that war is an enterprise that is very hard to predict. Realism and the two big fiascos. In my lifetime, I could not think of any two greater fiascos than the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Uh, as I said to you before, every realist opposed the Vietnam War. Uh, the two principal thorns, in my opinion, in LBJ's Heine during the run-up to Vietnam were Hans Borgenthau and Walter Lippmann, both card-carrying realists. George Kennan was opposed to the war. Ken Waltz was an adamant opponent of the war before the war went south in 1968. He was an opponent in 63, 64, 65. And with regard to the Iraq war, virtually every realist, again except for Henry Kissinger, opposed the Iraq war. Thought it was a boneheaded, idea to invade Iraq. So the point that I'm trying to make to you is if you adopt a realist foreign policy, it's clearly not an idealist foreign policy. There's no question about that. But you're going to get a lot less murder and mayhem in the system. And you're not going to end up with a militaristic state called the United States of America. You're going to get a restrained foreign policy, which I think is a good thing. Now, if you could convince me that liberal hegemony works, then I'd have real problems arguing with you. Because it works. And even though the costs may be greater, the benefits are really wonderful. But it doesn't work. It leads to disaster. So I say, from a realist perspective, we need a more restrained foreign policy. Bottom line, realism is not a recipe for peace but it's more peaceful than liberal hegemony.